morning celebration. How are we doing this morning? All right. Why don't you stand up and join us for worship? Sweet, sweet honey on my 
nothing can separate us from the love of God. No mountain or valley. Our God reigns forevermore. He is the King of Kings. He is the victor over everything. There's just something about victory, isn't there? And I don't know if you remember when you were little or maybe when your kids were little and they first started playing sports. And if you remember the teams at that time, they would play games, but they never got to keep score. And if you've ever been to a game like that, you see all those kids sitting on the sideline and all you hear them saying the entire time is, are we winning? Are we winning? I think we're just hardwired for it. There's something inside of us that wants to have the victory in such a desperate way. In the New Testament, the word for victory that's used is nikos. And it means that the victory has come by some kind of conquest, some kind of war in some shape or form. And it is only used in the New Testament to describe the victory that Jesus has won for his believers. So I want you to know that the outcome of the battle for your soul, it has been decided already, my friends. Jesus won it all. Now that doesn't mean that we don't continue to battle. In fact, as long as we're on this side of heaven, we're gonna have to stay in the game. There's gonna be a few battles that are gonna come before us. But the good news is that as long as we keep showing up, we win. And that's good news, amen? <laughs> all right, church, let's pray together that prayer that Jesus taught his disciples when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, why don't you take a moment this morning and just greet some people around you? And while they're doing that in the room, as always, I want to welcome all of you who are joining us online. We're just so delighted that you're a part of Celebration Church, that you take this time and you check in with us on a Sunday morning. We pray that you will be blessed by the rest of service. Well, as you're finding your seats this morning, I would love to take an opportunity just to welcome anybody who might be visiting with us for the first time this morning. We're so thrilled that you walked through our doors or maybe you found us out there online somewhere as well. Celebration Church is what's referred to as a convergent church. And what this means is that we blend together the influences from the evangelical, the Pentecostal, and the sacramental streams. And we hope that what you will experience here is a very modern worship experience, but one that is blended together or combined with traditions that date back to the earliest days of the church. It's truly our hope that you'll be blessed by your time here. If today is your first time with us, we do have one small ask of you. In the seat backs, you'll notice that there are some cards called a connection card. There's also a little QR code there if you like to just do things on your phone instead. Um, and on that card, it just asks for some very basic contact information. If you would be willing to fill that out during the service, you can just drop it with the ushers on the way out, or like I said, you can submit it on your phone as well. Um, we want you to know that we're not gonna hassle you, we promise, but we really would love to just send you a letter or maybe an email that thanks you for coming and spending this time with us. We'd love to give you just a little bit more information about the church in that letter and then some next steps you can take if you decide that you might like to find out a little bit more. But again, it truly is our honor to have you spending this time worshiping with us. Welcome to Celebration Church. Um, a couple of quick announcements for you before we get to the news. I just want to remind you, this is the time of year, you know, where we're all starting to get minded towards summer and that's 
great. We have so many great things happening in the church also, but we really do gear up in some things, especially if you have young people in your home, teens or kids and younger, lots of camp experiences and opportunities like that. So I just want to encourage you when you're listening to the news, sometimes we're like, yep, 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 I've heard that, but please lean in. We don't want you to miss things. We have so many great opportunities for your kids to connect. Um, I do also want to remind you that our youth, um, our youth program continues to run on Wednesday nights until the end of May. So if you've got middle schoolers or high schoolers, we'd love for you to get them there. Everything else you need is in the news. Hi, my name is Caleb, and welcome to Celebration Church. Rite of Passage is a day-long event intended for middle school students and their parents. Participants engage in conversations and activities intended to solidify their understanding of the foundations of our Christian life, as well as springboard conversations regarding the role of faith in everyday life and young culture. Attend either Saturday, April 29th, or Saturday, May 6th, from 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. For more information and to register, visit celebrationchurch.tv slash events. Mark your calendar for May 13th at 3.05 for Faith and Family Day at the Resch Center. Cheer on the Green Bay Blizzard indoor football team and enjoy a concert from Micah Tyler. Ticket prices are $15. You can purchase tickets online at celebrationchurch.tv slash events. Camp registration is open. Spencer Lake Summer Camp is one of the best weeks of the summer. You don't want to miss it. We join together with churches from all around the state for this five-day, four-night, overnight camp. Services and activities are tailored perfectly to suit each age level. Summer camp for students entering 7th through 12th grade is June 26th through the 30th. Kids camp for grades 3rd through the 6th graders is August 7th through the 11th. Spaces are limited, so don't delay. Set your kids up for one of the best summers yet. And speaking of summer camps, it's time to start figuring out what fine arts classes you're going to take. Registration for fine arts opens May 2nd. Celebration Dance would love to invite you to see Alice in Wonderland, a fun and whimsical production for the whole family. It's happening this coming weekend with three shows, Friday, April 28th at 7 p.m. and Saturday, April 29th at noon and 3 p.m. You can purchase tickets through celebrationdance.com or right at the door. We hope you can join us. Thank you for joining us today. Please enjoy the rest of the service. Good morning, church. Would you please stand with me as I lead us? I started with a well. Thanks. Someone pointed that out. Well? Let's pray quickly before uh, clearly I need it. Would you please join me together as we recite the Apostles' Creed? We'll save the prayer later. All right. This is our statement of faith and what we believe here at Celebration Church. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who for us and for our salvation was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the fellowship of believers, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as we uh, get ready now in our service, we turn to our time of offering and giving. And uh, if you are joining with us in person today and you'd like to give a check or cash, you can get one of the little offering envelopes in the seat back there, fill that out, and then as you leave uh, this morning, you can put that in the little offering basket that the ushers will be holding. Uh, Otherwise, you can give uh, online, digitally. Uh, You can go to celebrationchurch.tv 
slash give and give that way if you're joining with us online. Uh, or you can pull out your phone and scan the little QR code, and then that'll take you right to the link to give there as well. I appreciate you guys, your continued faithfulness and support in this church. Um, it's been fun to be a part of and to see your generosity. And we're, you know, as I mentioned last week, you know, it's exciting. We're paying off debt and finally making headway that way. Uh, future's looking bright, and I'm excited for it. Uh, now, this morning, my father, Pastor Mark, he is in Arizona. And as he likes to do when he calls me from Arizona, he doesn't say hello first. He says, it's 90 degrees. Thanks. Just to clarify that. So he's down there. It's warm. Man, I saw, was it really, oh, 38 degrees. Whew. We're getting there. There's hope. You know, people in Wisconsin, we have hope that others don't understand. <laughs> right? Spring came. We don't see it. But we have hope that it's coming. I know summer came for like four days couple weeks ago. But anyway, uh, now this morning, uh, we have a special guest with us. We've been trying to get him uh, here for a little while. It's been a little while since we've heard from him, but uh, with his, yeah, I think maybe he's been doing mountain climbing or something like that. I don't know, but he hurt his shoulder. Maybe it was less glorious than that, but he's had surgery, so we haven't been able to get him here. But would you please welcome uh, my uncle, Bishop Ed Gunger, this morning. <laughs> Right. Love you, man. Grace. <laughs> I'm going to have you stand, if you would, for the gospel. Get in your uh, exercise this morning, up and down, up and down. Uh, it's so wonderful to stand for the gospel because uh, it's, the, it's the story of Jesus. And this particular paracope, this particular story uh, in the New Testament is, comes to us from the actual first day of the resurrection. Just a few hours before this story, Jesus was in the grave. And so Jesus comes out of the grave, and Easter begins, and uh, we get this story. So let's listen to it. This is on the road, two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and Jesus comes up to them. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. It took a couple hours, two and a half hours. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened with Jesus, and as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. Odd. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and you don't know about the things that have happened over the last few days here? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel at certain expectations. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there? Hear a tape from that. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further, farther. And they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread he gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Does that sound like something you've heard before? And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And then he disappeared from their sight. <laughs> they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Let's pray. Father, help us see Jesus in our lives. Help us see him in this resurrection season. We ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. 
You may be seated. It's a delight to be with you today. Um, I'm a little bit uh, under the weather with a bit of a cold, but I've taken some good drugs. And uh, I like cold drugs because they make me love people more. And I just feel so pastoral, you know, I just feel like I really love everyone. <laughs> um, this is a season where we celebrate things becoming new. Often the celebrating of new uh, needs to be intentional because it's often disorienting. It's new, and we're not necessarily used to what's new. The resurrection stories that we are given in the Bible show us that the new that appears in the Easter story carries some definite disorienting kind of moments for Jesus' disciples. There were difficulties that emerged, these kind of odd silences in the text, misreads that happened. And it becomes clear that what happened was not easily accessible or readily understood by his followers. Rowan Williams, a scholar, writes about the resurrection, quote, the resurrection belief as laid out in Christian scripture is ideologically messy. It incorporates major tensions between presence and absence, legitimations and subversions, end quote. It turns out that Easter is not just this happy ending to the Christian story where everybody's getting together and partying. It's a provocative beginning that shocks the disciples. And as such, the first Easter ended up being disorienting and disruptive to them. The newness that appeared brought about what was unexpected and radically new, particularly about the presence of Jesus in their lives. For one thing, when you read about the disciples discovering Jesus had risen, they kept asking, where is he? Where's his body? What have you done with him? And they were haunted by this empty tomb, which comes to mean the place where Jesus was supposed to be, but wasn't. The various New Testament accounts speak of the disciples stooping in and bearing witness to this empty tomb. Some theologians believe that the focus of the Gospels on the empty tomb may be signaling something about the character of Jesus' presence post-resurrection that Jesus was going to be present to them in ways they had never experienced and in ways they did not expect. That perhaps the empty tomb was not so much an indication of the absence of Jesus as much as it was a signal that Jesus was going to take on a very different kind of presence in the world. I mean, in other words, how Jesus was present and would be present in humanity after the resurrection was completely new and unexpected. When you think about it this way, that would explain why people like Mary Magdalene, who was from the inner circle of Jesus' friends and is the first to see the risen one, right? She doesn't recognize him. She sees him, but she doesn't recognize him. She thinks that he's a gardener. And then as well, later that first day in our gospel reading, Jesus walks alongside two other disciples who had spent years with Jesus. And yet Luke reports from the text we read, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Why couldn't they recognize him? And are there times in our lives when Jesus is present, but we don't recognize him? Are there times in our lives when Jesus is actually present, but he prevents us from recognizing him? Is there something new in the way Jesus is present in the world of lives of his followers that we should be made aware of? In this Emmaus story, Jesus walks with them for hours. He's explaining the scriptures to them about what had happened. And interestingly, the text says their hearts were burning within them while he was doing that. Something was going on, but they still didn't recognize him. They arrive at their destination. Jesus pretends to travel on. They persuade him to come in with them. They eat together at that point where he takes the bread, give thanks, and breaks it, which is an obvious nod to the, the Lord's table the meal that Jesus had just inaugurated a couple of days before in which he said, every time you gather, do this in remembrance of me. 
And they, 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 he asked them to repeat it. And in Luke 24, it says, when Jesus had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and breaking it, he began giving it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And then he vanishes. He vanishes. <laughs> this is Alice down the rabbit hole stuff. I mean, this had never been done before. Jesus wasn't acting like this as he was with the disciples. The pre-resurrected Jesus didn't do this kind of thing. He was born in a manger. He carried out his life confined to time and to space. And you could locate Jesus. He grew up in Nazareth as he began his ministry. He moved from town to town, from place to place, and the crowds could follow him. His disciples were with him 24-7. He would jump in a boat, cross the lake. Crowds could walk around the lake and find Jesus. He was there to teach them. He would heal them, even of minor things like fevers. He would feed them. He would sneak off and pray. They would go and find him. He was findable. But here, post-resurrection, something has radically changed. The disciples couldn't seem to keep tabs on him. He, they couldn't seem to locate locate him. He was, he, he would, they, would, they wouldn't recognize him, then they did recognize him. He appears, then he disappears. Something happened to Jesus in the resurrection. A whole new thing emerged. Jesus' resurrection does not mean Jesus survived death. He really died. Jesus didn't come back to life like Lazarus did, Right? Resurrection for Jesus was not an extension of who he was. Something else has happened. Something new, something mysterious has happened to Jesus that doesn't fit into the way of the world as the world is understood or was understood. In his Creation and Fall lectures, Dietrich Bonhoeffer made this claim. Quote, the God of creation, of utter beginning, is the God of resurrection. The resurrection was God creating out of nothing. So in the beginning, when creation is made, God resurrects something. He brings something forward. It was something that had never been there before. He says, uh, the fact that Christ was dead did not provide the possibility of his resurrection, but its impossibility. It was nothing itself. There is absolutely no transition, no continuum between the dead Christ and the resurrected Christ. But it was the freedom of God that in the beginning God created God's works out of nothing. The resurrection of Jesus creates the new creation. He's simply trying to say that the resurrection was of a completely different order than anything that had appeared in creation up to that point. In Jesus' resurrection, a new reality dawns. A new creation comes to bear. Unlike Jesus in the incarnation, the resurrected Jesus wasn't tied to time and space. Post-resurrection, God's activities are no longer just echoes of what happened in the Old Testament. Neither are they echoes of what happened in the ministry of Jesus. In Jesus' resurrection, the created world actually gets joined to the uncreated world. <laughs> you say, what does that mean? Exactly. What does that mean? It means something than what we would expect. The risen Lord is Lord over being and non-being. What does that mean? This is how Jesus could move through locked doors and walls. How he could be present though not seen. How he could appear and disappear. We see it in these stories of Jesus in the Gospels after the resurrection. They're just crazy stories. The one with the Thomas is awesome. That fits right in here. This is John 20. It's talking about Thomas, uh, also known as Didymus, the text says. One of the 12 was with, not with the disciples when Jesus first came, right? This happened a week before. And so the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. And Thomas is going, oh, guys, come on. You know, you're just grieving or something. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and I put my finger where the nails were and I put my hand into his side, I, I'm just not going to buy into this, right? That's what he says. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with him. And though the doors were locked, Jesus just appears he comes and stood among them and said, peace be with you, which has to be a shocker. Then he said to Thomas, hey, Tom, put your finger here. <laughs> See my hands? Reach your, out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting 
and believe. Now, you, if you put yourself into Thomas's mind, Thomas's mind, what would you think? I mean, Thomas was there. He's making this very explicit statement. Unless I put my finger in his hand, unless I put my hand in his side, I'm not gonna believe it. Here's Jesus a week later who comes to him and says, okay, Thomas, here you go. Put your finger in my hand. Put your hand in my side. Thomas had to think, you're quoting, what? Those are my words. How did you know what I said? You weren't here. Or were you? And when he sees this, that somehow Jesus is present when he doesn't seem present, that's when he says, my Lord and my God. Right? This was the lesson that Jesus was teaching the disciples in the post-resurrection appearances. Whether you see me or not, I am with you. Whether all is going well with you or not, I am with you. And at the end of Matthew 28, when he's about ready to take off and he says, all authority is given to me, remember that text? He ends up telling them, he says, hey, surely I'm with you even till the end of the age. And he takes off and yet they're not freaking out. Why? Because they've had enough experience with him post-resurrect to realize even when he seems to take off, he's not really taking off. Jesus is with us even when we don't see him. That's new because the only way you really saw Jesus pre-resurrection is when you followed him around. You had to get in contact with him. You got to get in the queue to talk to Jesus. Well, here, Jesus is always just with them. This post-resurrection, new creation world, Jesus is present though unseen. This is what is still happening today. The unseen one is actually wandering in all of our lives today. In the resurrection, humanity and the created world are opened to the infinite, which is a grace beyond what was possible after sin had entered the cosmos. I think what I'm suggesting is that we have to stop thinking that we can easily locate Jesus in our lives. I think we should consider that the resurrected Jesus shows up in unexpected ways and is often disguised in our lives. That means that the resurrected Jesus is not ours to possess, though he's given himself to us. We can't possess him. We should still invite Jesus into our hearts and into our lives, into our relationships and into our stuff in ways that we really want to be involved. But the post-resurrection story suggests that what Jesus is really up to is not just wanting to get in our stuff, but he's inviting us into his life, into his resurrection, into his new creation, into his reality. (laughs) The resurrection life is more than just life that you know. It's not just the same kind of life that you now have. The new creation is not human life, you know, more vivid, (laughs) better color. It's not a baker's dozen. That's not what your new life is in Christ. This is something else completely. This, what this means is we don't know exactly where Jesus is or exactly what he's up to. And that we should start to develop in our faith a kind of suspicion. Where is he? Especially when we see empty places empty tombs. We should be saying, where is he? What is he doing in my life? We shouldn't be thrown by the emptiness that we see. Locating Jesus, I think, actually begins recognizing the empty tomb. This is an admission that we do not know precisely where he is and that he may actually be where it looks like he is not. (laughs) I'm in three situations right now in my personal life where I have been seeking God and all I see is an empty tomb. I don't see where Jesus is in the deal. And they're serious deals. And I'm trying to say, Jesus, where in the world are you? And, and I don't know where he is right now. But the nod to the empty tomb in our seeking the Lord always leaves us with an expectation of looking for him. Even though we end up a tad confused. Even though we're kind of ho- sort of hollowed out with wonder or feel like we're out of control. That doesn't mean in this post-resurrection story that things are amiss or gone or over or, or you can't have a life that's full of richness. It just means that sometimes in the emptiness, God is actually setting you up to move into a thing where God can express himself in ways that part of his eternal life. Father Timothy Radcliffe wrote this, 
Quote, God's glory always needs a space, an emptiness, if it is to show itself. The emptiness between the wings of the cherubim in the temple, when the Old Testament temple, they had that, uh, uh, the, the Ark of the Covenant, and they had two angels on either side, and the angels were pointing toward each other. And the idea was, God was saying, you can't make an image of me. You're not like the pagans who would make their gods in stone, and wood, and that kind of thing. But the, but the way they depicted God were these two angels pointing toward a space that was empty. And that was the glory of God. That God occupies empty spaces. And, when, and this, he goes on to say that God needs this emptiness to show itself, the glory, the emptiness between the wings of the cherubim and the temple, the empty tomb, a Jesus who vanishes in Emmaus. I'm suggesting that if you let such empty spaces be hollowed out in your lives, you will become thrones for God's glory. Now here's what this is saying. We think if Jesus was in our life, we wouldn't have problems. All our relationships would be full of peace. We would always have plenty of money and tons of friends. And we would always be healed when sickness kind of attaches itself to us or hits us. When you sense emptiness, when what you want to do is ask, where are you, Jesus? Why aren't you here? What we have to realize is that our expectations of how we think Jesus is supposed to be in our lives and how Jesus is supposed to act in our lives oftentimes hinders us from recognizing the actual presence of Jesus in our lives. We only see gardeners and fellow travelers on the road to Emmaus. Jesus remains hidden. But what Eastertide is about is about this season where Jesus keeps appearing and disappearing. And what he's teaching the disciples and, should be, and what we should accept as teaching us is that Jesus is with us even when he doesn't seem to be. And even when we can't seem to locate him, he is with us. And we should be nudged in our hearts instead of being thrown by empty spaces, excited that in the post-resurrection, that's exactly how Jesus wants things to work. That you and I can move with God and follow him even when things don't look right. And that, that in reality, in that empty space, we may feel like he's not there, but he is still there. Jesus is risen. Jesus is with you. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, let, 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 me, let me stop and just share two real quick wormhole ways to catch sneaky Jesus. Um, any Star Trek fans still in the world? There's three of us. In Star Trek, they used to be able to, when they're traveling around the universe, they'd find these wormholes. They'd go through those wormholes and get there a lot faster. There, there's a couple tricks, I think, to finding Jesus that's in our gospel, embedded in our gospel. Number one is, notice when they didn't recognize Jesus, they listened to him, and while they listened to him, their hearts were burning. There's something about the Bible. There's something about the word of God that if you'll attune yourself to him, God will show himself in those spaces. Your heart will burn. Something will begin, even when things don't look like they're working in your life. Always be open to the scriptures. And the Bible's not an easy book. I mean, nobody's saying that it is. I mean, some people that say that it's easy, they only read the parts that are easy. Right? People that say it's exciting, they only read the parts that aren't boring. But there's a lot of boredom. There's a lot of long stuff. There's a lot of stuff you don't get. But if you just stick with it, I remember years ago reading through the scriptures, I, and I still do now, I read through it on a regular kind of pattern. And when I read that, I remember telling God, God, you know, I'm reading this because I feel like I'm supposed to, but it's so boring. <laughs> it's not like God doesn't know what you think. Right? And, and I heard in my heart, I believe it was the Lord, I heard in my heart saying, just stick with it. And if you just stick with it, you, every once in a while, you'll see me peek out at you from the scripture. I'll peek out within it. Something will stick out to you. And so I began to read it. And I, you know, I, I thought of those, the, you know, da-dun, 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 you know, the kids have, da-dun, da-dun, da-dun. So I, just, I thought, okay, I'm going to read my Bible. It seems really boring. But if I really stick with it, boom, God's going to show me something, you know. And, and, and that, that's what's happened in my life. And the same thing for listening to preachers. I mean, if you just listen, you just listen, just stay open. Something will come to you. Your burning will come. That's the beginning. When you don't see Jesus clearly, at least you can have a sense of being in his thoughts and with his words. Learn to fall in love with God's word. Okay, and number two, lastly, number two. Fall in love with the time we have at the table. Look at what happens in Emmaus. They don't recognize him. They hear the word, they burn, but they don't recognize him until he takes the bread and breaks it. 
when he takes the bread and breaks it, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is why the church historically always said, always come to, as often as you can to the table. Because it's in that moment that you can catch the hidden Christ in your life. So come with faith and come with openness and watch how Jesus makes himself known in your life. The promise is, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So lean into the hunt. Jesus is alive. Amen. Amen. Well, as we get ready to move into our time of communion and the ushers can get ready, um, in obedience to the scripture, it tells us to pause and to examine ourselves. So we, before we partake, if you would please just bow your heads, allow me to pray a prayer of forgiveness over us all. Heavenly Father, before we partake of the bread and the cup this morning, in obedience to the scriptures, we pause now to examine ourselves. If we have sinned against you in thought, word, or deed, by what we have done or by what we have left undone, if we have not loved you with our whole heart, if we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves, for the sake of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a sacrifice for our sins, have mercy on us and forgive us of all of our sins and strengthen us in all goodness and by the power of your Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Now, uh, as we get ready to partake, you don't need to be a member of Celebration to take communion with us, but we just uh, ask that you are a believer. And then uh, the way we'll do it is, uh, as the ushers hand out the elements, um, we'll wait until everyone's received. And then once everyone has their elements in their hands, then we'll partake it together. Um, the outside ring is grape juice and the rest is wine.
let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the bread and the wine that we partake of this morning. And we ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would sanctify these elements and make them to be to us the body and the blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, Take this and divide it among you. This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Would you please stand as we sing this through one more time? Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. seated. Well, this morning, we have a special little dedication that we're going to be doing. Got some babies here. Uh, is Pastor Keith here? Literally in front of me. <laughs> Come on up. All right. Let's get some stuff set up. Good morning. Really? I'm sorry I work with kids. All right, good morning. All right, here we go. All right, well, we're excited about today, and uh, they'll get some things set up. We have a number of families coming out, and it's just a special time where we're going to dedicate their kids to the Lord. And really where, uh, if you haven't been here for this, this is the family saying, you know what, as parents, we are going to raise our kids up in the ways of the Lord. We're going to do our very best. It won't be perfect which anyone who's a parent knows that that's not going to work out, but uh, they're going to do their best to do that. So why don't you go ahead and give them a hand as they come on out today. It's a big thing. All right, let's move a few things around so you guys can all see. Thanks for coming, guys. All right, there should be a slot on the table you can find, right? We're all set. Everybody got your spot. Oh. All right, cool. Good, good. All right. Well, again, we're excited you guys are here. We're excited for the decision you've made, and we've talked, and uh, this is a big day for your little ones. And So let's go ahead and uh, move forward. I want to just draw your attention to uh, a little bit of Scripture. I'm going to start in Deuteronomy. All right, in Deuteronomy 6 says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commands that I give you today are to be upon your hearts, impress them on your children, talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, and when you lie down, and when you get up, right? This, this, uh, this faith journey is not just a Sunday experience, okay? And that's not just for you guys, it's for you as well, right? It's not just a Sunday experience. We want to go ahead and share with our kids uh, in our daily Life. And then Ephesians 6, 4 says this, Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Right? We want to train and instruct them. There's so many things that we can focus our kids' attention on. And, uh, and, there, and there are a lot of them are really great. But uh, utmost is the ways of God. And that's your primary uh, function as parents once you take care of their their needs. So, um, so, and I do, I challenge you guys to love God with everything you have and to show a loving home to your kids, all right? So I have a question for you, parents, 
So parents, by coming forward before God and his people, do you hereby declare your desire to dedicate yourselves and your child to the Lord? If so, please respond by saying, we do. Okay. We won't make you say that again either, but you're like, we do, I guess. But uh, we do. Okay. So let's go ahead and we'll continue on. Uh, I, we're going to continue on with uh, the dedication. So moms, if you have your kiddo, I want you to go ahead and uh, hand them off to dad as a sign of respect. Okay. And then we're going to have you guys light some candles. Uh, the Bible's full of symbolism, and today we have some symbolism. So mom, you can go ahead and light the long lighter, I guess we would call it. All right, and the first candle we're gonna have you guys light is the blue candle, which represents the life of your child. Psalms 127.3 says this, children are a gift from the Lord, and they are a reward from him. Right. Got it. And then the next candle that we'll have you light is the red candle, which represents the redemption through the blood of Christ. And Psalms 18.28 says this, the Lord will light my candle, the Lord will enlighten my darkness. And we so uh, hope and pray, right, that as your kids get older, they'll enlighten uh, them from their darkness. And then finally, you're going to light the white candle, which represents the dedication of your child to a life of purity before the Lord. And Psalms 51.10 says this, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Very good. We'll put those out. Then Pastor Phil, if you can go ahead and anoint and bless each of the kiddos. Just like riding a bike. A little one. Man, it's been a while since I had a little one like that. All right, let me anoint you guys. How's it here? Son of the Holy Spirit. Ooh. We got Oliver James. Hey, we're name these. I choose the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And who we got? Logan Mark. Let me just pray a little blessing over all you guys here. <laughs> then if you would, would you all mind standing with us as we join together with these guys? As we stand and pray this prayer of dedication, gracious God, giver of, of all life, we pray for these parents. Lord, give them wisdom and patience. Let your peace and joy dwell in their homes. Instruct them in your gospel truth. Strengthen them in faith. Sustain them through prayer. Order their lives by love. And then we pray for all these little ones. Be gracious to them, Lord. Draw them to yourself. Help them to love and to trust Jesus. And we pray that you will grow them in faith so that they might be like arrows in your hand. For Christ's sake, amen. All right, I'm going to give them all a hand. Thank you, guys. <laughs> you may be seated. All right, let me just close out in a prayer and a blessing here, and then we can head on out. Almighty and eternal God, so draw our hearts to you, so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations, so control our wills, that we may be wholly yours utterly dedicated unto you. And then use us, we pray, as you will, and always to the glory and the welfare of your people, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Be blessed. Have a wonderful week.
again God, I'm begging, please again I need you Oh, I need you Walking down this desert road Water for my thirsty soul I need you Oh, I need you Your forgiveness Is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips Like the sound of a symphony to my ears It's like home 